would like to welcome everyone to this podcast on proceeding supplementary, which can be found in Florida Statute 5629. My name is Brad Hughes, and I'm a partner at Jimerson and Cobb um, up in Jacksonville, Florida, and I've had some experience in litigating these matters, which I, I hope will be helpful to anyone that might want to listen to this podcast. So proceeding supplementary are a strange animal, and I think to really understand what proceeding supplementary are, you have to understand the historical context of how they were enacted. So Florida's proceeding supplementary statute was originally enacted back in 1919, and and just for some context, um, the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure were enacted in 1954. And so there's been, over the history of this statute, some difficulty in trying to figure out, you know, really the procedure of moving forward with proceeding supplementary. Um, A lot of times I think the judges um, in the court feel like it's a square peg in a round hole. Um, And so the case law, at least up until um, a a redraft of the statute in 2016, uh, addressed really those issues and what the court perceived as procedural um, holes and how to move forward with the case. Um, so a couple of general matters just to think about when you're dealing with these um, you know, proceeding supplementaries that, that there is case law that says there are special statutory proceedings. Um, and so generally when you have a, a, a statute that provides some special statutory proceedings, um, those statutes are strictly construed, and the best example I can think of is the Draken construction case, which was a, a, a lien case, and when you file, or when a lien is filed upon a homeowner's property, they can do a couple of different things. They can do a notice of contest a lien to try to shorten the time frame, but they can also file a lawsuit um, for an order to show cause, and so that's kind of a, a trick play, I guess, in construction lien law, in that if someone receives this complaint for order to show cause as to why the lien should, you know, continue to proceed, they or their attorney might file a motion to dismiss and and not realize that they're not allowed to do that because they're not operating under the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. They're operating strictly under the special statutory proceedings set forward in 713.214. And so, you might think proceeding supplementary are the same thing. It's a statute. It appears to be a, a special statutory proceeding. Um, but I can tell you from my own experience in Sanchez versus Rinda Broadcasting Corp, um, 127 Southern 3rd 627, that's Florida 50 CA 2013, that although these proceedings supplementary st- special statutory proceedings, um, they're equitable in nature and should be liberally construed. Um, that particular case was one in which I, I handled the appeal and the underlying, I guess, action, defense of it. Um, and uh, it, it was a little counterintuitive um, that you have um, special statutory proceedings, but they're equitable in nature. And I think the reason for that is, in general, um, statutory proce- or proceedings supplementary were created in an effort to aid a creditor in executing upon their judgment. And so just in general, the court wants to afford the creditor the largest uh, um, rights or the most um, encompassing rights that it can afford. And so just in general, um, proceeding supplementary are, are to be construed liberally to allow for execution upon assets. It was um, July 1, 2016, when proceeding supplementary statute was um, the redraft of the statute was was actually enacted and signed um, by the governor, and it attempted to address primarily the procedural issues for which the court previously struggled. So I don't intend for this podcast to be a, a, a difference or, or to go f- um, through with extreme care the difference between the 2000. 15 and prior statute and then the redraft in 2016 but I do think it's important to just go over you know some of the things that were required by the 2015 statute then we'll talk about some of the things in the 2016 statute and you can see kind of the procedural disconnect and why the redraft um, was implemented so um, 
Florida st uh, proceedings supplementary have been difficult and complicated for the courts to kind of get their head around because the procedure was really so lacking. So what Florida Statute 5629 says is that, you know, subsection 1 is when a person or entity holds an unsatisfied judgment, um, the lien holder may file a motion and an affidavit saying essentially that they have an unsatisfied judgment. And that once they file that affidavit and that simple motion, um, then proceedings supplementary are open at that point in time. And so what are proceedings supplementary? Well, I mean, generally you would bring a proceeding supplementary to, you know, have some action be brought against a, a third party. Um, perhaps someone that received a fraudulent transfer, um, perhaps someone that received, um, um, you know, some other benefit, um, or even for veil piercing and you know other matters such as that so does proceeding supplementary have to bring in a third party and implete what's called an impleter defendant no i don't think it does but i think most of the time when you bring these proceeding supplementary um, actions that's what you see so in the old statute you know what would happen is that there would be some order that would set forth an examination um, and the examination would take place in the county of the defendant's residence concerning property in the hands of um, this essentially third-party defendant. Um, and the order shall be served in a reasonable time before the date of examination in a manner provided for service of summons or may be served on such defendant or his attorney as provided for service of papers in the rules of civil procedure. Um, and so both of those um, sections, subsection 2 and 3, have created some difficulty with the courts. Um, first, you've got a situation in which, um, in subsection 2, that what is this examination? Um, where have we ever seen this in the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure? Um, it's just foreign. Um, it's not something that we've ever seen in the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure, and no one really knows what it is. Um, I can tell you that I think most of the people um, felt that it was just a deposition, um, but it, it's not a deposition. It's an examination, and the court can appoint a general or special magistrate. So let's say that you've got a defendant in Atlanta, which is exactly what we had in the Sanchez versus Renda broadcasting case. Um, and so we said, well, judge, they want to just take a deposition, but that's not appropriate. They need to have a special examination. So we think that this court should appoint or special magistrate. So we think this court should appoint a special magistrate, which is what the court did. And then we said, well, judge, um, we don't think that the special magistrate is simply there to, you know, listen. We think that they have something to do. Um, and so there obviously is going to be a court reporter there um, taking down what is said and transcribing um, what happens. And so we really think this is like the trial, and the trial is going to occur up in Atlanta. And, and you, you know, should treat this like a report and recommendations. And you can either adopt whatever the special, however the special magistrate rules, or you can, um, you know, commence with your own rulings and findings of fact. And the judge said, no, 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 I don't think that's what it means at all. You do have a special magistrate, but um, I, I, the trial is going to be down here, and the special magistrate's there just to preserve, uh, preside over anything that might come up. And so we said, okay, judge, so, you, so that means that the special magistrate is going to rule on objections and things of that nature. And so um, it's not going to be like a, a deposition in which... They can ask questions about anything that might lead to admissible discovery. Um, they have to preside with the rules of evidence, and they have to um, comply with hearsay rules and, and provide um, authenticated, you know, exhibits and documentation. And the judge said, "Well, no, I don't think it's that either." And I don't think we ever really figured out, at least at the trial level, exactly what that examination meant. But it certainly was confusing um, in in the matter that I handled. So um, subsection 3 deals with a situation that has probably been dealt with the most um, out of the many cases on proceeding supplementary, not one that was directly involved in the cases that I've handled, but it says you can serve, you know, like a summons, or you can serve um, pursuant to the 
rules provided by the rules of civil procedure um, or a service of papers, which is by mailing um, or, you know, even email um, at, under the current rules. So to cut to the chase, um, the fundamental long-term care case, which is the one that we're going to discuss later on here, says, well, you know, we think that uh, really what they're talking about here is not necessarily strict compliance with Florida Statute 48 for service of process, but we think that this is just general due process and general notice is really what's required. And so I think those cases that hint, at least hinted at the fact that you might be able to start proceeding supplementary by simply mailing someone in another state um, a notice or an order um, is what really caused the redraft committee to form and to think about what they needed to do. So um, if you move on to subsection 4, um, it just talks a little bit about what's going to happen at the special examination. And it says, well, testimony is going to be under oath. Um, you're going to... Um, your uh, any any testimony tending to directly or indirectly and in aid in satisfying the execution is admissible. A corporation must attend an answer by an officer who may be specified. An examination of witnesses shall be as at trial, and any party may call other witnesses. So, what does that mean? I mean, in my case, an example that I gave you, it was a case in St. Johns County, is where the Florida, which is where the proceeding supplementary was pending, but the examination was to occur in Atlanta, and so. How does that work? Um, can you compel people to come to the special examination that don't live in Atlanta or the surrounding counties? Probably not. So how do you call your other witnesses? Um, as you would treat them at trial, meaning you need to set depositions of those witnesses first? Again, it's confusing. Um, we don't typically handle you know, trials or pseudo-trials outside of the county in which a Florida case is pending, and the court essentially ruled in that instance that you know the special examination was really going to be a glorified deposition, um, and you know wasn't r really clear about what role the special um, magistrate would actually provide. So subsection five is just um, kind of. Um, asserting that a 726 claim, a fraudulent transfer claim, um, is, uh, you know, can form the basis of a proceeding supplementary. And then um, 6 talks about, um, 6A at least, talks about the fact that any transfers to a spouse or relative or a person on con confidential terms within a year is going to be presumed to be a fraudulent transfer, or at least presumed to delay, hinder, or defraud creditors. All right, so Florida Statute 5629, subsection 6B. Um, what's important here is the first sentence that says any gift transfer assignment or other conveyance has been made or contrived by the judgment debtor to delay hinder or defraud creditors the court shall order the gift transfer assignment and other conveyance to be void and shall direct the sheriff to take the property to satisfy the execution now you have to ponder why in the world is this um, statute even here it seems duplicative considering that just a couple of sections before um, they said that the courts had the power to enter orders to avoid essentially fraudulent transfers or transactions that might be fraudulent tran transfers under fire statute 726 so um, we'll talk a little bit more when we get to some case law interpreting these matters about what that means, but it is a big distinction. Um, subsection 7 just discusses a little bit more in detail about the special magistrate process that we had previously talked about. Um, number 8, you know, just indicates that, subsection 8 just indicates that a party or witness doesn't have the authority or the right 
to um, doesn't have the authority or the right to refuse to answer a question on the basis that it might incriminate themselves. Um, it's the last sentence in this subsection. It says an answer cannot be used as evidence against the person so answering in any criminal proceeding. But you have to think, how in the world does that apply? You know, or when you think about that in analysis, um, what is the application of that when someone's trying to assert their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination? Um, it's hard to imagine that that's going to constitute a waiver of, you know, one of the strongest, um, you know, rights in our federal constitution. I mean, then if you think about it just from a practice perspective, especially if it's a criminal, a federal criminal proceeding, I mean, what if someone admitted to tax fraud, you know, in their proceeding supplementary special examination? Um, and, you know, they subsequently get prosecuted and they say, well, you know, that's great that you're prosecuting me and that's great that I admitted to this crime in my special examination. But Flower Statute 5629.8 says that my answers cannot be used as evidence against me in any criminal proceeding. Well, I don't think that Florida Statute 5629 is going to have a whole lot of effect on a federal criminal proceeding. Probably more interesting would be what kind of effect it might have on a Florida criminal proceeding. Um, but I'm not aware of any cases that really address this particular matter. And so um, I don't know if there are any answers to those interesting questions at this point in time. Subsection 9 is probably the most important subsection. Um, and I'll tell you that the court may enter any orders, judgments, or writs required to carry out the purpose of the section, including orders necessary or proper to subject property or property rights of any judgment debtor to execution. And so you think about that, and we'll talk about exactly what that means, but it certainly gives you the rights against a judgment creditor, a judgment debtor, I mean. And it says, irrespective of whether such defendant has retained the property. So even if it was just in their hands for a short time and they passed it on, they can still get a judgment against them. But is there are there orders that can be more powerful than judgments, um, or at least as powerful? Maybe. Um, there's a couple of cases we'll talk about in a little bit later um, that can address what power and what authority the court might have. Now, of course, in subsection 10, um, failing to obey an order issued under this section by a judge um, can result in you being held in contempt or the judgment debtor being held in contempt. But I think that's the way it works with any court order is you can always be held in contempt if you refuse to abide by it, at least intentionally. So the, um, subsection 11 just talks about the, the taxation, taxable costs section. And so it says costs including attorney's fees shall be taxed against the defendant. And what does that mean? Well, um, the cases have interpreted this particular section, the term defendant, to mean judgment debtor. And so you can't get attorney's fees against impleter defendants, just against the original defendant, the judgment debtor. All right, so now we're talking about the redraft. Um, Florida Statute 5629, and I've got the 2016 um, edition up. This was, the redraft was enacted July 1, 2016. <coughs> so there are some substantial changes, um, mostly with the procedure. Um, and subsection 1 is not too different. It says, when any judgment creditor holds an unsatisfied judgment or a judgment lien, the creditor may file a motion and an affidavit so stating. Now, the, now you have to identify, if applicable, the issuing court, the case number, and the unsatisfied amount of the judgment, including accrued costs and interest, and stating that the execution is valid and outstanding. And, and once you do that, the judgment creditor is entitled to proceeding supplementary. Now, Subsection 2 gives us a little bit more information about what needs to be included, and it introduces a concept that was never included in the original um, proceeding supplementary. And so what it says is that upon filing your motion, your aff it, well, first it says that your affidavit 
in addition to saying that you have an unsatisfied judgment, now has to identify um, the property in the hands of the judgment debtor not exempt from um, execution. So property, debt, or other obligation is the term that's utilized. And upon filing this motion and affidavit, the court shall issue a notice to appear. Now it uses the term court shall issue a notice to appear, so I assume that means the judge should sign this. Um, but I don't know if that is absolutely required. Um, the clerk might issue the notice to appear, um, and I don't know if that means that it's fatally deficient. If you remember, um, the statute's to be liberally construed um, so as to um, aid in execution. Um, but probably, at least at this point in time, best practices is to have the judge issue the notice to appear. So the notice to appear shall direct such person to file an affidavit as provided in 5616, um, and that the court with a date certain, um, which date shall be no less than seven business days from service of the notice to appear, stating why the property debt or other obligation should not be applied to satisfy the judgment. So the judgment debtor, um, once they receive this notice to appear, only has seven business days to file an affidavit in the court that says why the property that's being requested to be returned or subjected to execution or other reasons or other things um, should not uh, uh, essentially move forward and shouldn't happen. So the notice to appear has got to be served in accordance with um, Chapter 48, um, so personally served. Um, and um, that clears up you know, probably the biggest issue that was the subject of appellate decisions um, from the prior version of the statute. And the responding affidavit must raise any factor defense opposing application of the property, including legal defenses such as lack of personal jurisdiction. Now, I'll tell you that this lack of personal jurisdiction section here was not in the prior statute. And there were at least some cases that would make you think that proceeding supplementary weren't really, never really obtained personal jurisdiction over any person. Um, they were simply getting in rim jurisdiction over a thing. Now, contrary to kind of that thought, if you were to play devil's advocate about whether or not you know, personal jurisdiction was absolutely required with the prior statute. It did allow a party to get a judgment against a, a person, um, but that judgment could never exceed the amount of the property that they had received, um, or um, you know, from the judgment debtor. So um, this, you know, ties up, you know, really a big issue, and you know, from before, and now. If someone transfers property or you know you know otherwise engages in behavior to defraud, hinder um, um, someone from their or delay someone from their property, um, if the judge if the impleader defendant is not subject to the jurisdiction of the courts of Florida, uh, you, you could have an international shoe hearing within your proceeding supplementary. Um, 3A is similar as before. You've got your one year um, a service of process. And if the property is you know, sent to a spouse, a relative, or another person on confidential terms, that transfer is considered to be um, is, is considered to be fraudulent. And it's actually the judgment debtor or the impleader defendant that has the burden to establish that such transfer was not made to delay, hinder, or defraud. So in subsection B, again, the sheriff can come out and levy upon the property, um, but it doesn't um, authorize seizure of property that exempted from levy. Um, again, at any time, the court may refer the proceeding to a general special magistrate who will be directed to report findings of law or fact or both. Um, but all the language about in the county where the defendant resides and things of that nature is now gone. So it really looks more just like any other um, you know, referral to a general or special magistrate except for um, in normal context, the parties would both have to consent to 
the you know um, referral of a civil matter to a general or special magistrate. Um, I'm not aware of any cases that have discussed whether or not subsection 4 is constitutional. Um, it does seem to indicate that the judge doesn't need the party's consent, um, but at the same point in time, you know, parties generally are entitled to an Article 3 judge if they want one. So I guess the jury is still out on exactly what um, that provision means and whether the parties can object to the proceeding being referred to a general or special magistrate. All right, so this is, um, again, continuation of Florida Statute 5629-2016, the redraft. And Section 5 is really not any different than before. It just says, again, that the party that is subjected to examination or um, testifies um, is exempt, essentially, from that testimony being used in any criminal proceeding. And there's really no substantial change in language in the redraft from before to now. Um, Now, in subsection 6, um, this is also a little different because it talks about the notice to appear, um, but it's still, you know, kind of the same concept in that, again, the court may enter order, may order any property not subject to um, any property of the judgment debtor not exempt from execution to be levied upon. And the court may also enter orders, judgments, or rents required to carry out the purpose of the section, including those necessary or proper to subject property or property rights of a judgment debtor to execution. Um, and so this isn't too much different than, you know, the statute before. It's a little bit different in the way that it's ordered. Um, and um, it makes specific reference to the notice to appear. Um, again, I'll talk about how powerful that particular section can be in just a few minutes here. Now, any person that fails to appear, obviously, or fails to abide by a court order or subpoena can be held in contempt. Um, the attorney's fees provision in here is in Section 8, and it's really similar than before. They changed the language debt uh, a defendant and replaced it to... Um, you know, costs and attorney's fees can be taxed against the judgment debtor. So the language is different, but the effect is the same because that's just really following or tracking the um, appellate decisions on this particular matter. Now, 9 is different because 9 talks about fraudulent transfers um, under Chapter 726. And so there's actually a different procedure um, in Florida Statute 5629 because you know, any other matters that we were talking about would just have to be brought by motion and by affidavit. But if you're going to bring a claim under 726, um, that's got to be initiated by a supplemental complaint and served as provided by the rules of civil procedure. And the claims under the supplemental complaint are subject to 7... Um, and the clerk of the court shall docket a supplemental proceeding under the same case number assigned to the original complaint or case number that's assigned. So, for anything else, you, you know, meaning that if you're bringing any action to, if there's any any action by the judgment debtor or an impleter defendant to delay, hinder, or defraud, at least the way I'm reading it, and there's no real case law that talks about this yet, those are brought just by motion and by affidavit, with no necessity of a complaint. Although you may want to file one just so that it looks like something like the court has seen before. But if you're bringing a 726 claim, um, then you have to bring that by supplemental complaint. And we'll talk about that in, in just a couple minutes, but there's some favorable case law for creditors that talk about statute of limitations being extended and things of that nature. And I'm not exactly sure how that 
you know, works with this new supplemental complaint process. Um, but it's clear that if someone transfers property from one to another, um, that's an act that you know seeks to delay, hinder, or defraud. Um, but I'm not certain that there's any elements other than those three to, um, you know, to win on that type of a claim. However, if you bring a claim, a supplemental complaint, and you travel under 726, then you're going to be traveling under the case law and the rules of procedure subject to just chapter 726. So all the elements that are required there are going to have to be proven um, in your supplemental complaint. And then, you know, any issues or things that might have come up, you know, case law interpreting that statute is going to be very helpful to what happens. So let's talk a little bit about some case law that has come about. Um, and I've got some pre-redraft cases here. So these are all cases prior to July 1, 2016. And let's just talk about how this might apply, you know, under the current status of the law and kind of go from there. So um, and so first and foremost, we were just talking about, you know, um, fraudulent transfers. And I'm looking here, I think it's the It's the Bell Rio case, Bill Rio case, um, which is you know almost down at the bottom, four up from the bottom. And it's a first DCA 2014 case, so this is before the redraft committee um, issued their um, you know new statute, I guess, or had the governor um, adopt it. But it says, although trustees are correct that the manner of provide, proving and defending fraudulent transfer claims under 5629 borrow substant, uh, substantively. From UFTA, this fact does not require the adoption of UFTA's much shorter limitations period because 5629's contrary scheme and precedent broadly established the availability of proceeding supplementary for the life of the judgment when a valid, unsatisfied execution exists. So, I don't know how the courts are going to interpret these matters moving forward, but with the redraft and with a brand new sub supplemental complaint for 726 claims, it makes me wonder if when you bring a claim for what appears to be and what we might colloquially call a fraudulent transfer, do you want to bring that claim both in a motion um, and just simply say delay, hinder, and defraud creditors? And then you can rely upon the Bell Rio case if you've gone outside of your one year shorter statute of limitations proceed. Um, your one-year statute of limitations in, in um, FUFTA cases, fraudulent deceptive and unfair trade, I'm sorry, um, fraudulent transfer act cases. Um, but I, I'm not certain if you bring a claim as a supplemental complaint under the redraft for 726, maybe the statute does apply with that particular um, provision. So it probably is a good practice to bring both a, a UFTA claim um, a 726 claim pursuant to the supplemental complaint and probably you know if you're going to go through that trouble you might as well just throw in there that it was you know meant to delay hinder or defraud creditors and that way if it's been longer than a year since the transfer happened um, you've got at least the Bill Rio case that tells you at the very least that your uh, delay hinder defraud claims are, are not barred it also makes you wonder if other statutes of limitations are also not applicable. So, for instance, you can see in the, really both the Sanchez v. Rinda case, you know, and the Rashtan v. Sheik case, that um, piercing the corporate veil cases are appropriate. Um, and so they have a statute of limitations period. Um, but if you have a judgment and it's 10 years old and you haven't collected, um, I think the Bell Rio case probably tells you that you can still pursue those um, claims um, as far as 
piercing the corporate veil goes as long as they're brought under proceedings supplementary. So we talked about the fundamental long-term care case before, um, and I'm not going to talk about that again. DeLuca v. King, DeLuca v. King was a case um, also in the second DCA that had really uh, tried to reconcile the holdings in fundamental long-term care. And what they said is, no, 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 this statute doesn't authorize service by mail of a party that has yet to be impleted or joined in the proceedings. And they say, a party impleted must be personally served in the manner provided for service of a summons if they haven't already been included in the case. But if they've already been included in the case, you just get to mail them papers or service according to what the rules of civil procedure. And so that case is helpful to us because it you know, lets us know that proceedings supplementary aren't just for impleter cases. Um, they're also for cases that, um, you know, are extended against judgment debtors. Because otherwise, if it was just impleter defendants, we'd have to serve everyone, at least in accordance, personally serve everyone, at least in accordance with the logic in DeLuca v. King. So the Geico versus Hollingsworth case here, um, is important because it, it stretches what type of case that can be brought in a proceeding supplementary even further. And so in this particular case, there was a, after judgment, um, Hollingsworth moved to add Geico as a party defendant because they felt that the insurance policy covered attorney's fees. <clears throat> See, it covered attorney's fees as a covered event. Um, and they had some language that they thought was helpful under the additional payment section of the policy. But just think about that. You win your case against um, your uh, uh, you know, judgment debtor, your defendant. The defendant says, okay, well, this is great, but I, I never, um, the insurance company denied coverage from the beginning of this. And so normally you might get an assignment of coverage rights from the insurance, from the uh, a judgment debtor, or you might pursue it as a third-party beneficiary in a coverage action, but those are generally separate actions that are brought outside of the context of the litigation. But here, um, they just brought them in, um, and, and so um, the court didn't find anything wrong with that. And I can tell you that I've handled a proceeding supplementary where um, – the um, plaintiff did exactly that. They um, obtained a uh, this in that case a covalence um, settlement with an assignment of rights, and inside that lawsuit, you know, brought their coverage action. Um, and so, you know, that's something to kind of think about when you're handling these cases is how powerful they are. Um, you don't have to just be a fraudulent transfer. Now we know that you can bring coverage claims and you can bring. Um, piercing the corporate veil claims and alter ego claims and all kinds of claims um, that you know are brought within the proceedings supplementary within the current lawsuit and it's important that you do it that way or that it can be done that way as opposed to an actual lawsuit because proceedings supplementary is generally so much quicker um, you implead them in they've got to file an answer within seven business days there's no motions to dismiss and fighting about you know, those kinds of things, unless perhaps you've brought a 726 um, complaint, um, supplemental complaint. And you can get right to it and take a couple of depositions and um, and, and have a, a essentially a mini trial. Now, the last three cases on this list, or at least the, the two of the last three cases on this list, um, deal with the fact that proceeding supplementary aren't even necessarily actions that are limited to Florida state court. So I've also dealt with a proceeding supplementary where there was a removal by an impleter defendant to federal court. And the law says, and it's the Jackson Platts case, um, 11th Circuit 2013, says that's completely inappropriate. Proceeding supplementary are independent actions that can be removed to federal court. So when you're thinking about what this means, and you, you look at the federal rules of civil procedure, um, Rule 69 is the rule that discusses essentially proceeding supplementary. And that particular rule says that state law concerning proceeding supplementary um, will control in a federal court, except to the extent the existence of federal statutes may preempt the state law. 
So, you know, I, I don't know really what the answer to this is and how they proceed, but what I've done in the past is just file a motion in federal court to proceed under the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, and um, that matter is still pending, so I guess we'll see how that goes. But I know that there's been at least one case where, you know, the parties get really ticky-tacky with each other, and the um, court had ordered the parties to proceed under the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure, and um, one of the parties was then, you know, poking at whether or not a federal subpoena should issue or a state subpoena, probably trying to make it more difficult on somebody to get jurisdiction over an out-of-state witness. Obviously, that's easier with the federal subpoena than the state's procedure, uh, or su uh, subpoena. But the federal court said, no, no, no. You're not going to have to go through the process of Florida subpoenas in federal court. You issue federal subpoenas. And honestly, I don't know what the rationale behind that was. I, I presume that the federal subpoenas are founded upon statute and that if you had to kind of logically work your way through that problem, you would say, well, if they're issued by statute, those statutes would, I guess, preempt state law that would also govern issuance of a subpoena. So this, um, these are the important post-redraft cases, and the statute's only a little over a year old now, and so there really aren't any cases that are important that deal with the procedure of the you know, redraft. And so the procedure is the entire reason why the redraft occurred. Um, but these cases aren't unimportant. Um, they um, help in kind of just fixing your mind and thinking about what proceedings supplementary are. Um, I'll tell you that the MYD Marine case is probably the most powerful case I've seen if you really think about what proceedings supplementary are and what they're supposed to do. And so in the MYD Marine case, um, the, the plaintiff, the judgment creditor in that case, um, wanted to get an assignment of another lawsuit in which the judgment debtor was a plaintiff. So said again, maybe a better way is that the judgment debtor um, in the MYD Marine case, you know, had some other breach of contract action or something like that pending in which they were a plaintiff. And so they were being difficult to the judgment um, creditor and obviously making collection um, difficult. So the judgment creditor said, well, you know, forget this. Um, I, I don't want to try to chase bank accounts and things of that nature. Um, the most important asset and the best asset you have is the lawsuit in which you're a plaintiff. And so judge, I don't want to have to go through and try to levy upon or garnish a lawsuit or try to catch those proceeds when they come in. You have the right to issue any order that might serve justice, essentially. So I want you to assign me um, the lawsuit and the trial judge said okay and then the fourth DCA affirmed and they said okay and so the judgment um, debtor in that case moaned and complained and said well you know our lawsuit is worth a whole lot more money than the amount that we owe to the judgment creditor so you know they are either going to um, there are so the the defendant and the lawsuit that we filed is going to get a windfall because the judgment creditor doesn't have, once they get this assignment of this lawsuit, doesn't have any desire to settle the lawsuit for anything more than what we owe them. Um, and the court said, too bad, so sad. Um, it didn't address the issue um, really head on, um, but it certainly, you know, made it very well known that the judgment creditor was to be afforded whatever rights um, they, you know, um, uh, would the statute would be liberally construed to confer, you know, great rights um, for um, collection. So if you think about that, you know, what, what can that do? What, what can you do um, with that in the future? 
um, when you're moving forward. Let's say that you've got a Florida case with a piece of real property in Georgia. Can you, instead of, since you can't levy upon it here, can you say, Judge, I, I would like you to issue an order, you know, mandating that the judgment debtor transfer me that property? Maybe. Probably. Um, could you say, Judge, um, I don't want you to issue a mandatory injunction because I don't think that um, the judgment debtor is going to actually do it. They'll stay in contempt. So could you issue an assignment? Uh, to that property and then essentially um, go and and use that to try to do whatever you need to do in Georgia to get the property sold or at least to prevent it from being sold you probably can do that um, what about you know uh, that that kind of opens up the possibilities to property to anywhere in the world as long as you've got personal jurisdiction over the party here um, you could have the court assign or issue orders affecting property perhaps outside of the state of Florida. Um, maybe um, that's outside of, you know, maybe some case in the future will say that that's outside of the court's jurisdiction to affect property rights that aren't within the state of Florida. But I'm not aware of any cases um, that prohibit you from doing that, at least not at this kind of point in time. Maybe in the future they might come up. So the Kennedy versus um, Rest Georgia um, R.E.S. Georgia um, Lake Shadow case, uh, you know, that just says that one thing that you do have to do before you can affect property rights is you have to um, you, you have to implead all of the parties that have at least an undivided interest in the property. And so in this case, it was, um, I think it was a former husband and wife, and so the property was, that were divorced, the property's tenants in common. They have a judgment against the husband, um, so they bring him in proceeding supplementary. Um, they actually get an order, um, you know, indicating that the judgment creditor is, uh, uh, you know, an un has an undivided interest in the property with the former wife. Um, and the wife complains about that. Obviously, she didn't have any notice of the proceedings, um, and um, she doesn't want to own an undivided interest with a stranger. Um, and the court says that we have to reverse that and do that again. Um, not certain if you're going to get a different result, but you have to at least give the wife the opportunity to argue um, since her property rights are being so closely affected by that. Now, the Kearney Construction Company case, it's an 11th Circuit case. I'll be honest, the um, facts in this were very complex and they were hard to, to follow. But what I took from this case was that, you know, the court ultimately has the decision about what it's going to do to aid in execution of judgment. And so the court had a couple of different ways in which it could aid in execution of judgment. Um, and the judgment creditor wanted a certain transaction unwound, um, but instead of doing that when the court could have, um, it, 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 uh, it went ahead and it, it entered and fashioned a remedy that it thought was more appropriate for the wrongdoers. And so instead of um, unwinding a particular transaction, it ended up voiding the assignment of a priority lien to uh, really accomplish a similar effect. So now that you've heard what I have had to say about proceeding supplementary, um, these are th some things that make you go, hmm. So first, proceeding supplementary, are they procedural or substantive? Um, I, I don't really know the answer to that question, and I don't know if there's anything that really addresses that. Um, there are certainly some aspects of it that seem to be substantive. Um, for instance, think about the supplemental complaint for 726, but the right to unwind transactions um, simply upon the elements of defraud, delay, and hinder. So when 5629 was entered, um, was that an actual substantive right um, to unwind transactions simply upon a showing of defrauding, um, hindering, or delaying? 
I don't know. Um, generally, if a statute creates a private cause of action, there's case law that says it's got to have those effectuating, you know, terms. You know, creates a private cause of action, and that's clearly not within the statute. Um, however, I'm not certain if it's intended to be procedural either. Um, if it's procedural, then that means that it can be changed any time, and you don't have any, you know, substantive rights to, you know, what you know, is contained within the statute. If it's procedural, then that means that, you know, whether or not the transfer occurred in 2013 or now, it's, you know, Florida Statute 2017, since it's 17, that's governing your, your you know, cause of action and not the statute at the time that the, you know, transfer or, or you know, bad actions occurred and not at the time that the initial judgment was entered against the judgment debtor. So I don't know the answer to that question. It's an interesting one. Maybe we'll get some case law that helps us with that. So we talked about this a little bit. Can you bring claims pursuant to proceeding supplementary that are time barred if an original lawsuit is filed? So let's think about a coverage action. You know, let's say that your coverage action is time barred, but um, you still want to bring that. I mean, you've got at least some case law that indicates that if you bring, you know, a matter within, you know, proceeding supplementary, that you're intended to be able to bring that matter um, for the life of the judgment. So I would say give it a try and see what happens. Um, you've got at least one case out there, and there's others as well, that talks about the fact that the statute of limitations of one year, at least in a fraudulent transfer, doesn't apply at the very least when you're bringing a defraud and delay and hinder claim um, in proceeding supplementary. Do you have to implead a non-party to utilize proceeding supplementary? Definitely not under the old statute. Um, under the new statute, um, they require you to, you know, uh, uh, they require you to plead what property was, not plead, I guess, but put in the motion what property um, is in the hands of a third party. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to imagine how you're going to satisfy that without a third party, but, you know, maybe, um, but you definitely have some, some case law from before that indicates that you don't have to have an impleader party. Um, also, it just makes me think in the Sanchez case that, that I brought, um, in, in that case, there wasn't a transfer at all. And that's what the issue was. Um, the issue essentially was, um, when you don't have a fraudulent transfer, um, is it possible to bring a claim based upon proceeding supplementary? And the court, you know, relied upon that improper conduct, delay, hinder, or transfer language, you know, for the basis to say, look, even when this is just, and, and in that case, what had happened was a uh, radio tower um, um, lease was entered into not by the entity that was going to operate the radio station but by a shell company that was never funded and so then there was um, some dispute over the lease and so the shell company just defaulted and then let the judgment be entered by default and so the argument that we made um, at trial and to the appeals court was well look um, you know they can bring an action for piercing the corporate veil um, as an actual lawsuit, but without a fraudulent transfer, proceeding supplementary are not appropriate. And so the court affirmed the lower court's decision to allow the proceeding supplementary to move forward, um, but they wrote an opinion and explained why. And they said that the statute doesn't require a fraudulent transfer. It requires, you know, delay, defraud, hinder, or improper conduct. And if any of those things are alleged, it's proper to bring the, the matter as proceeding supplementary. So kind of lastly, what I'll leave with you here is just what problem there always is in collection proceedings, especially if you have a motivated judgment debtor. It's just the difficulty in you know finding the account and freezing the account before the money is gone. So the musical bank account problem. And so... Now, I would just posture that instead of trying to play musical bank accounts, um, that you try to use your your creativity in these proceedings supplementary and see what you might be able to do. Whether that means that you get um, you implead in third parties that may have 
defrauded, hindered, or delayed your execution or engaged in improper conduct with your execution and bring them into your case and let them try to defend themselves and potentially have them subject themselves to judgments. Um, they may, if they have any kind of influence over the judgment debtor, may be able to convince them to work out some kind of settlement with you. Um, or, you know, you can just be creative in the orders that can be entered. And if you get the judge is, you know, upset enough with the conduct of the judgment debtor, the judge might issue an order that mandates um, that trans property be transferred to you. And the person could be held in contempt if they refuse to do that, even if the property is, at least arguably, even if the property is not within the jurisdiction of the Florida courts. Um, the judge can issue an assignment. So you can just say, Judge, you know, I want to have an assignment of XYZ. Um, and so I can tell you that we've um, requested that the court assign um, essentially a judgment creditor. A, uh, a husband's rights to equitable distribution in a divorce case. Um, and I think that you can use those same kind of concepts for many, many, many different other kinds of assets as well. So I would say just try to sit back and think about how it is that your judgment debtor makes money. And however it is that your judgment date makes money is an asset. And see what you can do to try to get at that asset. Get it from the source instead of the back end, which is when the money is deposited. Um, and uh, if you do that, I think you have the rights to be more aggressive and go to those source funds um, or source clients. And, um, and perhaps you don't have to, um, you know, try to play musical bank accounts. And, you know, I'll leave you with one last example that this is a commercial judgment debtor. Um, and, you know, they do most of their business in a state outside of Florida, for instance. Um, and there's some, um, you know, vendor accounts and things of that nature, um, distribution accounts. You know, ask for an assignment of the, of the contracts with the distributors or an assignment of the contracts with, um, you know, certain vendors. And then you can just, you know, take the court order and by email or by mail notify that vendor or that distributor that, you know, whether or not they receive goods from the judgment, you know, debtor, um, payment for those goods have to go to you because you've been assigned at least the right of payment. So I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, you know, feel free to send me an email at bhughes at jimmersoncobb.com. That's B-H-U-G-H-E-S at J-I-M-E-R-S-O-N c-o-b-b dot com um, thanks a lot and uh, happy hunting for your um, um, assets through proceeding supplementary